Hello everybody, this is Danny, back from Deep South Homestead on my porch time. We've decided to do porch time in a different place on the house here. We've got many places at our house that we can entertain that we're actually on a deck right now that overlooks the back of our property here. And you'll notice in the background that you'll see the, the bees off over here on this side that we mentioned in a video that we have coming up. You'll see the Irish potatoes up here in this corner of the video. And right below it right there, you'll notice there's a terrace row. Right above that terrace row, we just shot a video of us planting our um, sweet potatoes. So to kind of give you a little bit of an idea about the way things look around here in perspective, and you can see the Irish potatoes on the hill are doing exceptionally well. They're probably up about 16 inches tall now, beautiful green plants doing really really good um, but the subject on the porch time today I'm a little bit concerned because I get I've been getting first of all I don't watch much TV okay so y'all understand I hardly ever turn the TV on I hardly ever even watch the news because 90% of it's propaganda anyway so I, I I do watch the weather and different things like that but I have been getting some information from some people that are really reliable people that threat of an attack on this country has really increased tremendously in the last week or so. Some of the threats that I've been receiving are, are, are pretty grave concern to me because predominantly most of them are aimed at the west coast states all the way from Canada down to Mexico and and that is a concern to me because we have a lot of viewers that live out in that area out there and, and with that you know I don't know how true any of this is I have no way of actually knowing I just know that it's been thrown out there it's, it's been on the news because I have seen it on the news that there's an elevated risk for people on the western part of the United States and I I guess as I thought about that, I decided to maybe that today we needed to talk a little bit about that, about what what would you do if an EMP happened. I know that if an EMP was to happen, you're going to lose a majority of the population, not, not because of the EMP itself, but because of the chaos afterwards. You're going to have those people that that live off of life support. Um, you have people with pacemakers. Uh, you know, it's there's just an astronomical amount of people who would, who need electricity to be able to sustain their life, and um, these would be the first people that would go almost instantly. Then you've got um, the groups that will follow thereafter. People that. Uh, diabetics that need insulin refrigerated and um, I mean I'm not trying to be a scare person here y'all please understand that it's just that I am concerned um, you've got those people like that, that you know like, that have to have their insulin so they they're gonna need to be doing something pretty quick and in order to be able to maintain their health and you're gonna have cancer patients that's got to have treatment and uh, you know, there's just there's just an astronomical lot of things and then afterwards the the carnage that will take place just from disease and pestilence sets in you know within a 90 day period that stuff starts to set in uh, that's why I think that I'm gonna start dedicating my porch time to being able to survive the way our forefathers did see our forefathers didn't know anything about electricity so an EMP would not have affected them whatsoever. They would have went on everyday walk of life and would have not have known that anything ever changed in their life. The sad part about it is, is most of these skills have been lost. They've not been passed down. And most of them are really quite simple. It's just that Nobody seems to care because of the modern conveniences today. And, and I'm going to just take each, each porch time, I think, I'll just take a few minutes of just mention something that's really, really simple that 
might help you in an event of something like this happening. I know it's what we do here on a daily basis. Now, EMP would set us back. I'm not going to say it wouldn't because of the modern conveniences. It would. It definitely would set us back because Wanda and I already live such a simple life until I guess the hardest part for us would be the extreme heat in the summertime here. The homes here are not designed anymore like the old homes were for ventilation and uh, I know after Hurricane Katrina the temperature in my house reached over a hundred degrees and it just stayed there because the house is so insulated that once the in internal temperature reached that point uh, it was almost unbearable just to stay in the house. And even though we'd leave the windows up on it at night, I had to sleep out on the porch in a tent at night just to be able to, uh, you know, take the heat because it was over 100 degrees every day and you couldn't stay in the house. The floors began to buckle and stuff like that. So every climate will have its challenges. But what I want to basically start talking about is some ways that you can survive and still be able to have something to eat. I will, there'll probably be some segments on, you know, about water and uh, maintaining gardens and different things like this. I'm gonna just take and do little little snippets here and there. Probably won't be anything in depth. Some of it you may already know. Some of it you may not. But the first thing I'm gonna talk about is it has to do with gardening and. The way I can relate to this is, is because when I was a kid growing up, these are things that I remember as a child. And as a child, every time you saw a person in the garden, especially an older person who had a hoe in their hand, they always had, and I'll show you here, they always carried one of these in their back pocket. Now this is about, a, this is a 12 inch file. I can well remember my daddy or anybody else when he was in the garden. He kept one of these in his back pocket all the time. And as he would hoe through the field, he would stop periodically. And he'd take this file and he'd brush the edge of his hoe up. Because I hoed in fields for many, many years as a young man growing up. And the secret to a successful hoe is the edges of my hoes are like razor blades. If you hit yourself with my hoe, you're going to get cut and you're going to probably have to have some stitches. And that's the way that the older people like to keep their equipment because when it comes to cutting weeds down, you don't want a dull hoe because the harder you got to chop against a weed, the more you're going to wear yourself out physically. Now that I've mentioned the file, I'm going to take and show you that on my homestead here, we use a hoe all the time. Now there's different hoes for different jobs. Now I'm not going to go into all the different hoes because I'm not a I'm not a hoe person who understands everything there is to understand about hoes. I'm just going to tell you that what I use here. Now there is some hoes that I would love to have that I don't have. And if I ever come across them or a way to get me one of them, I'm going to get them. One of them is the old, they call it a scoby hoe. It's a real heavy head on it with a hole in it, and you took a tapered handle and you put in it, and the harder you pulled against it, the tighter it gets. It's kind of like a pick with a tapered head on it. The harder you pulled against it, the tighter the head got in the hoe. Now, I don't have one of these. Um, if I ever come across one, I'm going to probably try to get one. But one of the things I'm going to mention about hose and, and pieces of hand equipment that we use here on the homestead, we hardly ever buy anything brand new. Most everything we have, I've either picked up at an antique place or I've seen at a garbage dump that somebody has thrown away and I've picked it up and brought it home. That's one of the ways on homesteads that we survive without having to spend a ton of money. Now the first hoe I'm going to show you is I have a hoe here. This hoe has a wide face on it. It's really narrow. And it has what's called a gooseneck. This is called a gooseneck hoe. Now when I go out to the field and I'm going to hoe up a row or I'm going to hoe dirt up around something, this is the hoe I'm going to take with me because it's wide, it's narrow, I can pull a lot of dirt with it really quick. Now this hoe head was found at a dump 
And what I did was I went out in the woods, and you'll notice the handle on it here. I don't know if I can get the right angle, but the handle on it here, all I did was found me a young pine sapling in the woods that was tall and straight, and I cut that thing off about six foot in length. I brought it to my shop. I hand peeled it while it was still green. I drove a nail in the end of the handle right up here. And I hung it up in the barn and just let it hang for about a year. And this is something I do on a periodic basis as I'm in the woods. If I see something that looks like it'll make a good handle for me, whether it's a hoe, a shovel, a rake, or whatever, as I find them, I cut them down, bring them out to my barn, and I hang them up. And I just let them be hanging there drying because in the event that one of these handles break or something, I've got a replacement handle for my hoe. Now... One of the other types of hoe that I have here is this one here. Now, this is a homemade hoe. This was a piece of steel rod right here that was heated and bent. This right here was part of an old sawmill blade. Now, this sawmill blade was cut out in the shape that we wanted, and it was welded onto the back of this. And this was an old piece off of an old hoe that was laying out here that been long gone the handle was rusted out of it so I used this as a collar for this and as I put it up in I drill a hole up in the end of the wood I might want to add that with these gooseneck hose you have to drill a hole up in the end of the handle and you shove this piece up in there and then you drill a hole through it and sometimes I'll put a pin in it and sometimes I'll put a screw it just depends on you know how I feel at the moment or what I'm up to but now this particular hoe is made different this hoe has a triangle on the top of it it's a lot thicker in this way, and it's a lot shorter this way. This hoe is not only razor sharp on this edge, this hoe is also sharp on this side and this side. That is simply because whenever I'm hoeing in a field, be able to take this hoe and to hoe in between my plants with it, this coming toward me, but if I'm hoeing between plants that are really close together I turn this hoe up on its edge and I hoe with the edges on it because they're just as sharp as the sides are and therefore this hoe is what I use when I'm hoeing around plants now the other hoe I use was for bed nut rows this one is one that I made myself and it is strictly made for hoeing around plants with now the handle on it also was a young tree that I found in the woods a young pine sapling I peeled it, and a lot of the times I'll take, you can find this at your local grocery stores, I take organic flaxseed oil, which is, they say the same thing, linseed oil, and I, I'll take a rag when this is really dry, and I'll go ahead and coat these handles with that flaxseed oil, and I'll just let them hang, because what that does is, is that makes them water repellent, and should they get damp, they're not going to rot off in the head here because all that's coated with oil all up in there and it's had time to saturate in the wood because I'll go probably once a week and I'll take an oily cloth and I'll re-wipe these handles when I've got them drying. And as I do, they, the oil continues to soak into that wood and it makes that wood water repellent. And that way I can take and have a hose that'll, my hose usually last me for years without anything going wrong with them. Because we keep them all in the barn, we don't let our we don't let our hose lay out in the weather, or any of our equipment actually lay out in the weather. But in the event of a electromagnetic pulse, EMP, or whatever you want to call it, you're going to have to know some basic skills if you're going to survive. Now, anything that will make your life easier during one of these situations is going to be a plus. The hose, knowing the right hoe for the right situation will make your life a whole lot easier because you're going to burn up less energy using one of the, the right hoe for the right job. Now, I'm going to show one other thing here that one and I used this this morning, planting our sweet potatoes. It's something that as a kid I always saw my dad with and any of the older old timers always had these. Is when you go out in the woods, you hunt you up a stick it's really forked and small on the end right here and I take my knife and I cut it off to two little points right here and this stick is probably I don't know it's probably five and a half six feet long 
what I do with this stick is when we take our sweet potatoes, we have our we have our beds bedded up in the field out there. There's a video of us planting sweet potatoes, and you'll see this very stick right here in use. And what you do is, is when that sweet potato is dropped on the ground, you take this stick and you just grab the end of that draw and you just shove it down in the ground. That saves all that bending over and trying to pack dirt around the hole and all this stuff. And when you get through, you just pour water in the hole and it washes the dirt around it. And your sweet potatoes are planted. So this is another little thing that will make life a lot easier on you in planting. These are things that doesn't cost a lot of money. Things that our forefathers could use at a moment's notice. They just walk out in the woods and cut what they needed. Or either they kept them hanging in the shed when they needed they just went and got it. For all of y'all that are out there that are my subscribers and my friends and that live on the west coast where this elevated risk is at right now, I, I would urge y'all to look into this because I don't know if what I've been told is 100% accurate or not, but y'all mean a lot to me. And if it is a real threat, then... I want to make sure that y'all are aware of it, and a lot of you may already be aware of it. I don't know. It just was brought to my attention, and I just couldn't hardly stand the thought of not at least mentioning it. I hope you've enjoyed what you've seen on Porch Time today, and it'll be beneficial to you in some kind of way. And I want to also say a big thank you once again for all those who've given your support. For Wanda and I, and your prayers has went up before the Almighty Father. I, I really appreciate that because I am healing. It is a lot slower than what I had anticipated. The pain is a lot greater than what I anticipated, not due to the surgery, but just due to the gas they put in me. I am recovering, and it, but I do realize it's going to take a while. But Wanda stepped in, and she's kind of filling in that void right now during this time of being, me being down. And we're able to work as a team and get things done. So I hope y'all enjoy the videos that we're able to put out here in the, in the, in the near future. And thank y'all for subscribing and thank you for watching today.